So, good day to all of you. So, we're already in Chapter 5, which is all about CPU scheduling. I hope that your brain cells are ready so that we can learn the different scheduling algorithms that is used in CPU scheduling. So, let's start our lesson. Okay, again. So, Chapter 5 is all about CPU scheduling. So, the contents of Chapter 5 are... First is we have the basic concepts and then scheduling criteria, the scheduling algorithms, thread scheduling, multiprocessor scheduling, real-time CPU scheduling, operating systems examples, and algorithm evaluation. So the objectives of Chapter 5 are describe various CPU scheduling algorithms, assess CPU scheduling algorithms based on scheduling criteria, Explain the issues related to multiprocessor and multi-core scheduling. Describe various real-time scheduling algorithms. Describe the scheduling algorithms used in the Windows, Linux, and Solaris operating systems. And apply modeling and simulations to evaluate CPU scheduling algorithms. So the basic concept of scheduling is we should have a maximum CPU utilization obtained with Multiprogramming. So, with multiprogramming means the CPU must always be kept busy. It should have uh, numerous processes that it can execute anytime. And then we have this CPU I/O or input/output burst cycle. So, process execution consists of a cycle of CPU execution and I/O wait. So, we have this illustration. So. For example, load store, add store, and read from file commands, these are classified as CPU burst. And then, of course, after executing these uh, commands, we have wait for I.O., so that is categorized as I.O. burst. And then, again, another execution of commands, store increment, then index, write to file, uh, CPU burst again. And then, of course, it always follows with the wait for I.O., which is, again, an I I.O. burst. And then again, repeatedly, the load store, add store, and read from file, a CPU burst, and a CPU burst is always followed by an I.O. burst, as, I've, uh, as it is indicated here. So, CPU burst followed by I.O. burst. So, CPU burst distribution is of main concern. So, for the histogram of CPU burst time, so large number of short bursts and small number of longer bursts. So, the curve, which is, this is the curve, is generally characterized as exponential or hyper-exponential with a large number of short CPU bursts and a small number of long CPU bursts. Okay, next is we have the CPU scheduler. So, the CPU scheduler selects from among the processes in ready queue and allocates the C a CPU core to one of them. So, queue may be ordered in various ways. So, C CPU scheduling decisions may take place when a process, first, switches from running to waiting state. Number two, switches from running to ready state. Number three, switches from waiting to ready. And number four, terminates. So, scheduling under 1 and 4 is non-preemptive. So, the term non-preemptive means you cannot interrupt while the process is executing. So, that is why it is called non-preemptive. And all other scheduling is preemptive, meaning the opposite of non-preemptive. If a process is uh, currently in execution, and for example, you have a higher priority or your processing time is shorter, you can preempt the currently executing process. So that preempt and then the newly arrived process will be executed by the CPU. So consider access to shared data, consider preemption while in kernel mode, and consider interrupts occurring during crucial OS activities. So specifically for interrupts, so if there is an interrupt that is happening in the system, so the processes are preemptive in nature. So next is we have the dispatcher. So the dispatcher module gives control of the CPU to the process selected by the short-term scheduler. So this involves switching context and then switching to user mode and jumping 
to the proper location in the user program to restart that program. So dispatcher has this uh, term dispatch latency. So the time it takes for the dispatcher or to stop one process and start another running. So we've already, if you can remember the context switching, so we have this dispatcher. So this dispatcher um, stops the process that is executing. So we have this one. So P for, for this illustration, so P sub zero is the executing. And then the dispatcher will save the state into program counter block sub zero for P sub zero and then restore state from PCB sub 1 for uh, P sub 1 or for the process 1 and then P sub 1 is executing. So saving state and saving state of one process and restoring the state of another process that is the dispatch latency. So next is we have the scheduling criteria. So scheduling criteria, uh, of course, uh, they have this um, conditions or factors that affects the scheduling. So we have this CPU utilization, keep the CPU as busy as possible. And then we have also throughput, number of processes that complete their execution per time unit. So for example, the, the, the throughput means the sh uh, it should have in a, sh in a shorter span of time, number of processes should be uh, finished in execution. And then we have the turnaround time, amount of time to execute a particular process. So the shorter amount of time that the process needs, the better. And then the waiting time, amount of time a process has been waiting in the ready queue, of course. So the, the shorter the waiting time, the better. And then next is we have the response time, amount of time it takes from when a request was submitted until the first response is produced, not output for time sharing environment so the the shorter the res, uh, the response time so the better okay so the scheduling algorithm optimization criteria is of course maximum cpu utilization of course as it is said make the cpu as busy as possible and of course maximum throughput because again throughput means the number of processes that should be completed in a certain amount of time and then, of course, minimum turnaround time. And then minimum waiting time, of course, and minimum response time. So first is we have the first come, first served, or FCFS scheduling. So we have this example. So three processes from P sub 1, P sub 2, and P sub 3, and their corresponding burst time. So P sub 1 has 24 milliseconds. Then P sub 2 is 3 milliseconds and P sub 3 is also 3 milliseconds. Suppose that the processes arrive in the order P sub 1, P sub 2, and P sub 3. So that is why uh, for first come, first serve, um, you should um, indicate the order in which the, the processes arrive. So since the order is like this, P sub 1 is first and then of course P sub 2 is second and P sub 3 is the last. So the gun chart for the schedule is, so since the burst time of P sub 1 is 24, so from 0, we're going to start our gun chart from 0 and then up to 24, that is P sub 1. And then next is we have P sub 2, so we have 3, so 24 plus 3 is equal to 27. And then P sub 3 is also 3 milliseconds so 27 plus 3 is equals to 30 so this is the gun chart for the fcs or the first come first serve scheduling so how are we going to calculate the waiting time so again waiting time is the time it takes uh it will wait for for the cpu uh, to execute that particular process so the waiting time for p sub zero a piece of one rather is zero why because um, because it, it, it arrived first, so from time zero, it already has executed, so it does not have any waiting time. Okay, P sub 2's waiting time is 24 milliseconds. Why? Because when, when did P sub 2 um, started uh, uh, to be executed? After 24 milliseconds. So it's 
um, waiting time is 24 milliseconds. And then last but not the least is we have P sub 3. So P sub 3's um, waiting time is 27 because as you can see in the GAN chart, when the P sub 3 started uh, to be executed by the CPU, it starts after uh, 27 or in 27 milliseconds. So that is the waiting time. Okay, so let's return. So the average waiting time is you have to get, of course, the average. So add the waiting time of P sub 1, P sub 2, and P sub 3. So 0 plus 24 plus 27 divided by 3 is equal to 17 milliseconds. So that is the average waiting time for the whole um, scheduling of first come, first serve scheduling. Okay, so... That is the example. So, suppose that the process arrive in the order. So, we ha also have the same burst time for the next example, but the order has changed. So, the order, um, P sub 2 arrived first, and then P sub 3, and then last is P sub 1. So, as you can see, the gun chart for the schedule is, so P sub 2 and P sub 3 are both 3 milliseconds. So, for P sub 2, from 0 to 3 milliseconds. And then for P sub 3 is also from plus 3. So that's why it, it became 6 milliseconds. And of course, last but, last but not the least, we have P sub 1, which is 24 milliseconds. So 6 plus 24. So we have 30. So, okay. Um, you have to be sure for your, uh, for your burst time. So, so, so you're not going to have a mistake. Uh, let's return to the uh, given burst times. You have to add this first to make sure that your gun chart, the maximum number or the maximum millisecond of your gun chart um, should be um, aligned or should be the same with the total number of burst times. And again, for the gun chart, it should always start with zero because if you start with one, so your gun chart and the, the times that you're going to need for the waiting time and average waiting time will be wrong. So you have, again, you have to make sure that the total burst time here, which is 24 plus 3 plus 3 is equal to 30, it should be the same with your gun chart. And again, the gun chart should always start with zero. Okay, let's continue our discussion. So, the waiting time, so for P sub 1 is what? So, for P sub 1 waiting time, so since this is the um, throughput or the process, uh, the P sub 1 is processed by the CPU, so its waiting time is 6 milliseconds because P sub 2 and P sub 3 is being executed at that time. And then P sub 2 is equal to 0. Why? Because P sub 2 is the first one to be executed, so it has 0 millisecond uh, waiting time. And then P sub 3 is equal to 3 because um, P sub 2 is executed first for 3 milliseconds and then it is followed by P sub 3. So that its waiting time is 3 milliseconds for P sub 3. So the average waiting time is we have... 6 plus 0 plus 3 divided by 3 is equal to 3. Okay. As you can see, we did not change the value of the burst times of the processes. But why is that? For the second example, this is the waiting time is shorter. While if you're going to return to the first example, is we have the average waiting time is 17 milliseconds. So actually, the in first come, first serve, the order of the, the processes matters. Specifically, um, this will be a uh, first come, first serve will be optimal if the longer processes will be executed later. And compared for this example in which P sub 1, um, it arrived first. So that's why for 24 milliseconds, P sub 2 has waited uh, it's like that. It's it is like this. Um, P sub two, which only needs three milliseconds, it has a longer time to wait than for it to be executed. Okay, so of course, as you can see, this is only three milliseconds for the average waiting time. So this is much better than the previous case. So what is this effect? So this is called the convoy effect. So short process behind long process. So consider one CPU bound and many I.O. bound processes. So an example in real life here for the convoy effect is, for example, 
um, uh, you and another student. So you are going to, uh, you're in line or you're in queue and then you're going to photocopy a 100-page book. And then um, after you, is you have another classmate that it will only photocopy one page. Okay, so um, for the photocopier personnel, for example, um, actually, it, it, it ha I, I don't know if it really happens to you in real life, but there is an instance, for example, that the personnel will ask, oh, how many pages are you going to photocopy? So since it's also one, uh, you will be asked, oh, can, can I accommodate first this person because it only has one page compared to yours, which is 100 page. It's like that for the person who has one page, um, the time it, that time it takes to wait is longer than the time that it will be served. So of course it's only one page uh, for in my in my experience of course I I yielded uh, I I allowed that uh, he or she will be the one to be first to be served because it's only one page compared to 100 pages and then um the uh, the next is uh the person or the student with only one page so the waiting time will be lessened if of course the shorter um the shorter time is going to be executed first than, for example, uh, the, uh, any tasks or activities or processes that will take longer to execute. So this is an example of first come, first serve scheduling. Again, the order of the process matters and it affects depending upon the length. And also, it is this is ideal if the longer processes will be executed or they will arrive later. So next is we have the shortest job first or the SJF scheduling. So associate with each process the length of its next CPU burst. So use this length to schedule the process with the shortest time. So that is why shortest job first. It will process the shortest time. So SJF is optimal, gives minimum average waiting time for a given set of processes. So that's the good thing with SJF. This is always almost the, the best among the scheduling algorithms that we're going to study for, for this lesson. So the difficulty is knowing the length of the next CPU request and could ask the user. So we have an example of the shortest job first. So for this example, we have four processes and then their corresponding burst time for p sub 1 is we have 6 milliseconds for p sub 2 is we have 8 milliseconds for p sub 3 is we have 7 milliseconds and p sub 4 we have 3 milliseconds so for this uh, for this example it is assumed that all the processes arrive in um, all at the same time so what we're going to determine here is the shortest uh, shortest burst time of all again we have to calculate the total burst time so that we we can be sure that in the gun chart uh, the maximum burst time should appear uh, the the figure should appear last in the figure in the gun chart so 6 plus 8 is we have 14 14 plus 7 is equal to 21 plus 3 is equal to 24 so that's why for the gun chart the, the maximum number of burst time should be 24. Uh, should be no more, no less. It should be exact 24 because of the total number of burst time. So, since this is shortest job first, so the shortest uh, job here for the process is we have P sub 4. So, that is why we have here P sub 4 is the first to be executed for 3 milliseconds. So, we have from 0 to, to 3. And then, we're already finished with, with P sub 4. Okay, we're already finished with P sub 4. Then next is we have, which is the shorter, 6, 8, and 7. Of course, we have P sub 1. So that's why it is the next to be executed. So 6. So 3 plus 6 is equal to 9. So after we finish executing P sub 1, next is we have P sub Three, which is 7 so we have 9 plus 7 is we have 16 and then last but not the least after executing p sub 3 is we have p sub 2 which is 8 milliseconds so 16 plus 8 is we have 24 
So we already finished executing these four processes. So of course, waiting time of P sub 4 is 0. And then for P sub 1, its waiting time is 3 milliseconds. So this is why it's 3. And then P sub 3's waiting time is we have 9 milliseconds. And of course, P sub 2's waiting time is 16. So 3 plus 16 plus 9 plus 0. And then divided by 4 is we have 7 milliseconds. So next is we have determining length of next CPU burst. So can only estimate the length, should be similar to the previous one. Then peak process with shortest predicted next CPU burst. So can be done by using the length of previous CPU burst using exponential averaging. So T sub N is the actual length of nth CPU burst. We have this um, symbol, a uh, predicted value for the next CPU burst, and then alpha. Zero is less than or equal to alpha, is less than or equal to one, and then define the form this formula. Uh, N is equal to one, is equal to um, for this uh, for this formula. So commonly alpha is set to one half. So the preemptive version is called the shortest remaining time. First. So, this SJF is non-preemptive while another one, the preemptive version of uh, SJF or shortest job first is called the shortest remaining time first or the SRTF. So, how does this SRTF done? So, we have the example. So, for the next slide. So, for this um, slide 15. So this shows an exponential average with alpha is equal to one half, and then um, zeta is equal to ten for this figure. Okay, next is we have examples of exponential averaging. So if alpha is equal to zero, so zeta n plus uh, zeta sub n plus one is equal to zeta sub n. So recent history does not count if alpha is equal to 1 so this will be equal to alpha t sub n only the actual last cpu burst counts so if we expand the formula so we get so for zeta sub n plus 1 so we're going to expand the formula so since both alpha and 1 minus alpha are less than or equal to 1, each successive term has less weight than its predecessor. Okay, so we have an example of the shortest remaining time first. So now we add the concepts of varying arrival times and preemption to the analysis. So again, we have four processes and their corresponding arrival time and burst time. So P sub 1 has 0 millisecond arrival time and then burst time is 8 milliseconds. For P sub 2, arrival time is 1 milliseconds and burst time is 4 milliseconds. So P sub 3 is we have arrival time of 2 milliseconds and burst time is 9 milliseconds. And of course, last but not the least is we have P sub 4, arrival time is 3 milliseconds and burst time is 5 milliseconds. So... Our Gantt chart will start with, since P sub 1 is the first to arrive, of course, so it will be processed first. So, again, its burst time is 8 milliseconds. And then you have to take note that after 1 millisecond, P2 arrives. Okay, so that's why its millisecond is 1. So, by this time, P sub 1 is already processed 1 millisecond of its burst time. So, we're going to change 8 milliseconds here to minus 1 since um, 1 millisecond is already finished. So 8 will be, minus 1 will be 7. And then, of course, for the uh, CPU, pause. Piece, uh, uh, the CPU will compare the burst time of P sub 1 and P sub 2. So 7 against 4 since our example here is shortest remaining time first so since p sub 2 is shorter so as you can see with our gun chart so p sub 1 has processed only for 1 milliseconds but c second rather but since p sub 2 is shorter than p sub 1 
So, P sub 2 will be executed or P sub 1's execution will be preempted by P sub 2. So, that's why P sub 2 will be executed. Okay. So, uh, P sub 2 is executed and then again we're going to take note that P sub 3 arrives after 2 milliseconds. So, by that time, P sub 2 has already processed uh, 1 millisecond of its burst time. So, we have, okay, 3. And then we're going to compare P sub 2 and P sub 3, which is shorter, of course. P sub 2 is shorter. So, it only continues to uh, execute the process by the CPU. So, as you can see here, so P sub 2 has only continued processing. Okay, next is we have, uh, after 3 milliseconds, um, P, sub, uh, P sub 4 arrives and then we have 5. So, by 3 milliseconds, P sub 2 has already executed another of its uh, burst time. So, another one. So, we have comparing P sub 4 that has arrived 3 milliseconds after. So, P sub 2 only has 2 milliseconds left of its burst time. So, since it's still shorter, so it will just continue to execute without any uh, preemption of other uh, of other um, processes. So that's why since P sub 2's burst time is 4, so 1 plus 4 is equal to 5. But you have to take note that there is comparison um, that, that, has, uh, that has been done because of the arrival of P sub 3 and P sub 4. So the question here, what if, the uh, P sub 3 or P sub 4 is shorter than the remaining time of P sub 2, of course, it will also be preempted. But for this example, since P sub 2 is already uh, already has a minimum burst time compared to P sub 3, P sub 4, so it only continued to execute until it has finished after 5 milliseconds. Okay, next. So, we're already finished with P sub 2. So, the only comparison since... All of the processes P sub 1, P sub 3, and P sub 4 is already there. So, you have to compare 7 for P sub 1, P sub 3 is 9, and then P sub 4 is 5. So, shorter is P sub 4. So, that's why P sub 4 is the next to be executed. So, 5 plus 5, so we have 10 milliseconds. So, P sub 4 has already finished its execution and then again comparison between p sub 1 and p sub 3 because this these are the only processes that is that that uh that are left here so 7 and 9 so p sub 1 is lesser so that's why p sub 1 is executed next so 10 plus 7 is equal to 17 so it has finished execution and of course last but not the least we have p sub 3 which is 9 so that's why 17 plus 9 is equal to 26 so that is the uh, end for the gun chart of this example so how are we going to calculate the average waiting time so for p sub 1 p sub 1 is we have this it has uh, finished um, processing at uh, 10 milliseconds and then for for the waiting time we have 10 okay so that's why it's 10 why is it 10 minus 1 because for the first millisecond p sub 1 has processed 1 millisecond of its burst time so that's why 10 minus 1 okay so this is for p sub 1 Okay, next is we have P sub 2. So, where is its uh, supposedly waiting time? Its waiting time supposedly is 1 because, um, because, uh, because, of this, uh, because of this gun chart. But if you're going to notice the arrival time, since its arrival time is also 1 second, so, 1 minus 1, so we have 0. Actually, in reality, P sub 2 does not have any waiting time. It only shows here because of the gun chart. Okay, next is we have, um, for P sub 3, is we have, the waiting time is, this is P sub 3, so we have 17 
this is the waiting time but since p sub 3 arrived 2 milliseconds after so you're going to subtract the arrival time 17 minus 2 is equal to 15 and then next is we have p sub 4 so p sub 4 is the waiting time is 5 but the arrival time is 3 so it's only it's waiting time is only 5 minus 3 is equal to 2 so let's add so 10 minus 1 is 9 plus 0 plus 15 plus 2 divided by 4 so 26 divided by 4 is we have 6.5 milliseconds okay so aside from the preemptive sjf so we also have the round robin or rr so each process gets a small unit of cpu time or time quantum q usually 10 to 100 milliseconds after this time has elapsed the process is preempted and added to the end of the ready queue if there are n processes in the ready queue and the time quantum is q then each process gets 1 over n of the CPU time in chunks of at most q time units at once. So no process waits more than n minus 1 times q time units. So timer interrupts every quantum to schedule next process. So the performance, if q is large, and then we, have, we will have the behavior of a first in, first out q. And then if q is small or the quantum, Q must be large with respect to context switch, otherwise overhead is too high. So let's uh, let's have an example for round robin. So round robin with time quantum of 4. So we have this example, the example the same with the first come first serve. So P sub 1 is 24, P sub 2 is 3, and P sub 3 is also 3. Okay, since time quantum is 4, um... Of course, that's why it's called round robin in game. You will give chances to all. So for these processes, they will have a time quantum of 4. So for P sub 1, it is said that though it is 24, so it will be given 4 milliseconds. So that's why P sub 1, 0 up to 4 milliseconds. So we're going to change this. It will be 20 Okay, then next is we have P sub 2, which is 3. Since it is lesser, so it fits the time quantum. So, of course, we have 4 plus 3 is equal to 7. So, P sub 2 is already finished. And then P sub 3 is also 3. So, P sub 3. So, 7 plus 3 is equal to 10. So, it is also finished um, executing. So, let's go back with P sub 1. So, next is another 4. So, 10 plus 4 is equal to 14. So, this will be 16. Okay. So, this is the P sub 1. And then, another P sub 1 again. Another 4. So, we have 12. Okay. And then, another 4. We have 18 plus 4 is we have 22. So, we have... Uh, Eight. Okay. And then another four. Okay. Eight minus four is four. So this is for the another piece of 22 plus four is equal to 26. And last but not the least is we have four minus four. It is also finished. So that's why 26 plus four is equal to 30. So maybe you have a question as why do we have two? Since this is already all P sub 1, why does it have to be divided for the time quantum? Just to show that uh, the time quantum is equal to 4. Uh, it means that it still has a looking for, uh, we have this um, um, division. Uh, just to uh, illustrate the time quantum. Um, so you can uh, if if the, if does that have any division for starting from ten to thirty, it means that it only continues to uh, process uh, or execute the process. So for this uh, round robin, you have to show the actual time quantum needed. So typically, higher uh, average turnaround than SJF because 
higher uh, a third around because of the number of switches that it will make but better response because all the processes are given or uh, being served at least for example for this example all processes will be served for four milliseconds each until it has finished their burst time so q should be large compared to context switch time so because of course if the Q is small, then overhead is too high. Usually, uh, quantum is 10 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds. Context switch is less than 10 microseconds. Okay, so we have this illustration. So, time quantum and context switch time. So, if your quantum is 12 and then your process time is equal to 10, it does not have any context switches because 10 uh, burst, uh, 10 millisecond burst time fits the 12 millisecond uh, quantum, uh, quantum time given. Okay, next is we have what if the quantum is 6 and then the burst time is 10. So we have one context switch because it will execute first, it will give uh, 6 milliseconds of its time and then after that there is context switch for other processes and Next is the remaining of the 10 millisecond burst time. Okay, next is what if we have the time quantum is 1 millisecond. So how many context switches? Of course, we have 9 if it is 10 millisecond burst time. Because you're going to, of course, to, to show the context switches. So why is it 9? So 1. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So that is the number of context switches. Okay, next for, for this slide, for this illustration. So the average turnaround time of a set of processes does not necessarily improve as the time quantum size increases. So that's why 80% of CPU bursts should be shorter than Q. So, turnaround time varies with the time quantum. Okay, next is also another type of scheduling. We have priority scheduling. A priority number or integer is associated with each process. So, the CPU is allocated to the process with the highest priority. So, mostly for Windows, for example, smaller integer has the highest priority. So, but for real world or for uh, for the sake of learning, you can also set that the the larger the number, the higher priority that it has. But uh, mostly for computers, the smallest integer has the highest priority. So for priority scheduling, we have preemptive and non-preemptive. So SJF is priority scheduling where priority is the inverse of predicted next CPU burst time. So, what is the problem of priority scheduling? The problem is called starvation. Low priority processes may never execute. So, for example, in a real world situation in which there is a queue, and then you, you, you lined up for that queue, and then there is a sign that for pregnant women, for senior citizen, if there if are persons with disability pwd if any one of those types of person arrives in the queue you should give way so what if you you lined up you're the first in the the line and then what if one of the uh, indicated persons uh, pregnant women senior citizen or pwd arrives so since they are priority you have to give way no matter what what if for every for every transaction finished with this type of persons, there is always uh, someone uh, has arrived, which is, again, uh, one of those three. So it means you'll never be served because they're always the priority. So that is what is called starvation. Uh, you will never be given a chance to be served because uh, the, the number of the people who are arriving in the line are are the most uh, prioritized citizens okay so what is the solution for example the solution for that is what we call aging as time progresses increase the priority of the process for example um 
you are preempted by a, a, a higher priority person. And then, um, you have this counter so that um, later on, you will also be served because you've already waited uh, so much time. It's very unfair for that. So sometimes, for in a real-world situation, the lane for for this uh, highly prioritized persons, they have separate lanes compared with the normal lane. Okay, so we have an example of priority scheduling. So we have five processes, their corresponding burst time and their priority. So P sub 1, burst time is 10 milliseconds, priority is 3. P sub 2 is 1 millisecond burst time, priority is 1. P sub 3 is 2 millisecond burst time and then 4, uh, four number 4 priority. P sub 4 is 1 burst time and then number 5 priority. And then P sub 5, 5 millisecond burst time and priority is number 2. So it is assumed that they arrived all at the same time. And at the same time for priority scheduling, the smallest number here is the higher, the highest priority. So for priority, we have P sub 2. So that's why P sub 2 is executed. So since it's one millisecond only, so P sub 2 has already uh, finished its execution. Okay, next, priority number 2 is P sub 5. So that's why this is the next to be executed. So 1 plus 5 is equal to 6. Okay, then next is we have... Third priority is P sub 1, so 10. So 6 plus 10 is equal to 16. And then it has finished its execution. And then next is priority number 4. We have P sub 3, so that's why we have here. So we have uh, two burst times. So 16 plus 2 is equal to 18. So it has finished execution. And last but not the least is we have... P sub 4, which is has the highest pri uh, uh, highest number of integer, which means lower priority. So, one burst time. So, P sub 4, 18 plus 1 is equal to 19. So, calculating the average waiting time for P sub 2 is its waiting time is 0. Then, the waiting time of P sub 5 is 1. The waiting time of P sub 1 is 6. The waiting time of P sub 3 is 16 and the waiting time of P sub 4 is 18. So, getting the average divided by 4, the average waiting time is 8.2 milliseconds. So, we have also this example, priority scheduling with round robin. So, when this, uh, uh, this uh, algorithm is used, if there is a case that there is, uh, is two, uh, rather, there are two uh, processes that has the same priority. So, run the process with the highest priority, processes with the same priority, run round robin. So, gun chart, so for example, for priority scheduling with round robin, gun chart with two millisecond time quantum. Okay, so our priority here is P sub 4. So that's why from 0 to 7 milliseconds, P sub 4 has executed. So next is we have second priority, they have a tie. So P sub 2 and P sub 3. So it says here that processes with the same priority must run round robin. Okay, so for the convention of the processes, since this is round robin, since P sub 2 um, is lesser the number of P sub 3. So, let's assume that or let's follow that P sub 2 must be executed first. So, that's why it is executed but remember we have a 2 millisecond time quantum. So, to give an uh, equal chance to the tide uh, in the priority. So, P sub 2 is we have 5. So, 5 minus 2 is we have 3. So, that's why 7 plus 2 is equal to 9. And then P sub 3 also has the second priority. So, also it has given with time quantum of 2 milliseconds. 
So, 8 minus 2 is equal to 6. So, this because this is the second priority, um, the CPU must finish all the, uh, the, all the burst time of P sub 2 and P sub 3. So, next is we have, so we're already finished with this one for P sub 3. Then, let's go back again with P sub 2. So, 3 minus 2 is equal to 1. So, this is 1. 11 plus 2 is equal to 13. And then, next is we have 6 minus 2 is equal to 4. Okay, we have 4. So, this is the 1. 13 plus 2 is equal to 15. Then, let's go back with P sub 2 again since it's only 1. So, that's why 15 plus 1 is equal to 16. And then, P sub 3. So, for P sub 3, we have 4 since um, this is the only priority. Uh, uh, the, the other P sub 2 has already finished its, um, its burst time. So, for P sub 3, it will just continue to execute. So, P sub 3, 16 plus 4 is equal to 20. Okay, so it already finished execution. And then, we again, we have another uh, processes with the same priority. So, P sub 1 and P sub 5. Again, let's um, put a P sub 1 first. So, that's why. So, 20 plus 2 is we have 22. So, 4 minus 2 is equal to 2. While P sub 5, we have 3. 3 minus 2 is equal to 1. So, that's why for P sub 5, 22 plus 2 is equal to 24. Okay. Then, next is we have, let's return to P sub 1 since it has 2 and time quantum is 2. 2 minus 2 is equal to 0. So, that's why 24 plus 2 is equal to 26. So, P sub 1 is already finished. And then, lastly, is we have P sub 5, it has only 1 uh, millisecond burst time left. So, so, 26 plus 1 is equal to, sev to 27. So, that's why um, it already also finished its execution. So, this is priority scheduling with round robin. So, next is we have the multi-level queue. So, with priority scheduling, have separate queues for each priority. So, schedule the process in the highest priority queue. So, they also have queues. For multi-level Q, so priority 0 has the highest priority, while priority N has the lowest priority. So, multi-level Q, so prior prioritization based upon process type. So, for real-time processes has the highest priority, followed by system processes, interactive processes, and the lowest priority are the batch processes. So, if we have multi-level queue, we also have the multi-level feedback queue. So, a process can move between the various queues. Aging can be implemented this way. So, multi-level feedback queue scheduler defined by the following par parameters. We have number of queues, scheduling algorithms for each queue, method used to determine when to upgrade a process, method used to determine when to demote a process, and then method used to determine which queue a process will enter when that process needs service. So we have an example of multi-level feedback queue. So we have three queues. For queue sub zero, we have round robin with time quantum eight milliseconds. So this is the queue sub zero, which performs round robin. And then queue sub one, so this is queue sub one. Round robin time quantum mil uh, 16 milliseconds. And then Q sub 2 is we have FCFS or first come, first serve. So it only means that, for example, if you have a process and then it's less than 8 of the quantum time of the round robin, it will finish the execution. But if, it, if this will not be finished at the first queue, it will be passed to the second queue, another ro round robin which has a longer uh, time quantum of 16 milliseconds. But, uh, again, if it has finished its execution, it will exit the queue. But, 
uh, if uh, if the process does not yet uh, is has not finished yet its execution even after Q sub one, then it will be lined up on the third Q, which is the the scheduling algorithm is already first come first serve. So the scheduling, uh, this is the explanation. So a job, a new job enters Q sub zero, which is served FCFS. Okay, it is a correction. It should not be FCFS, but round robin. So when it gains CPU, job receives eight milliseconds. I already explained it. Actually, if it does, let's just um um uh, reinforce the learning. So if it does not finish in eight milliseconds, job is moved to Q Q sub one. And then at Q, Q sub 1, so which is 16 milliseconds time quantum, uh, it is again served as, again correction, it should be round robin and receive 16 additional milliseconds. So if it's, it still does not complete, it is preempted and moved to Q sub 2, which is the first come, first served. Okay, if we have CPU scheduling, we also have this thread scheduling. So, distinction between user level and kernel level threads. When threads supported, threads scheduled, not processes. Many to one and many to many models, thread library schedules user level threads to run on LWP. So, known as process contention scope or PCS, since scheduling competition is within the process typically done via priority set by programmer, and then kernel thread scheduled onto available CPU is system contention scope or SCS, competition among all threads in the system. Okay, we have the two terms. So PCS or the process contention scope means that the scheduling competition is within the process and then for the system contention scope, the competition for scheduling is among all threads in the system. So for P thread scheduling, so the API allows specifying either PCS or SCS during thread creation. So for P thread, so we have scope process and scope system for scope underscore process schedules threads using PCS scheduling. Then for, uh, for scope underscore system schedule threads using the SCS scheduling. It can be limited by the OS, Linux, and Mac OS only allow pthread underscore scope underscore system. So this is the code for the pthread scheduling API. This is only the continuation of the code. Okay, next is we have the multiprocessor scheduling. CPU scheduling more complex when multiple CPUs are available. So, multi-process may be any one of the following architectures. We have multi-core CPUs, multi-threaded cores. We have NUMA systems. As you can remember, NUMA means non-uniform memory access systems. And then we also have heterogeneous multi-processing. So, for multi-processor scheduling, so we have symmetric multi-processing is where each processor is self-scheduling. So all threads may be in a common ready queue for letter A. So we have uh, uh, core raised to N. So a uh, core sub N, meaning uh, how many cores that you have. And then they have a common ready queue for, it, uh, for all the cores. So another approach is, each processor may have its own private queue of threads. So, or per core run threads. For core sub zero, it has its own queue of threads. For core sub one and co uh, core sub n, they have they have their own um, queue of threads. So next is we have the multi core processors. So recent trend, so we have different, so multiprocessor means physically there exist two or more processors in the system. While for multi-core processor, again, you only have physical uh, processor, but the core that it contains has two or more. So recent trend to place multiple processor cores on same physical chip, so faster and consumes less power, and then multiple threads per core also growing. So, it takes advantage of memory stall to make progress on another thread while memory retrieve happens. So, this is for the thread. So, the thread is composed of compute cycle and memory stall cycle. 
So how does the uh, the CPU will schedule or will do the multi-core processor scheduling? So this is the illustration for the multi-threaded multi-core system. Each core has greater than one hardware threads. And then if one thread has a memory stall, for example, for this one, for thread sub zero, so it has a compute cycle, since it will undergo, it will be followed by a memory stall. So the CPU will execute the next uh, thread, thread sub one. So since thread sub zero is still in the memory stall, it can start another thread for compute cycle. And then what if, uh, again, uh, after that, um, while the threads uh, sub 1 is in memory stall, thread sub 0 is already executing the, uh, its document. So you can see it's alternating. So that uh, by, this, um, by this setup, the CPU is actually busy. Uh, if it is a person, the CPU does not ha have any time to rest because every time there is a memory stall for one thread, the other thread will execute the compute uh, it, it will uh, implement the compute cycle okay is uh, next is we have the technology for multi-threaded multi-core system is the chip multi-threading or cmt assigns each core multiple hardware threads so intel refers to this as hyper threading so hyper threading starts with pension 4 so this is an example of a processor with four cores or what we call quad core and then on a quad core system with two hard uh, two hardware threads per core the operating system sees eight logical processors so don't be uh, amazed uh, since uh, the market it said that it only has um, dual core or quad core but if you can see with the operating system view since these are logical processors so it means that uh, because they have their own hardware threads so it can see as eight logical processors so one two three four five six seven eight so that's the view of the operating system so two levels of scheduling so the operating system deciding which software thread to run on a logical cpu and then how each core decides which hardware thread to run on the physical core so for the software threads so the os will decide which software thread to run on a logical um, cpu so that's why there is also a selection Okay, next is for multiple processor scheduling is we have this so-called load balancing. So in symmetric multiprocessing um, system, need to keep all CPU loaded, CPUs loaded for efficiency. So we have this term load balancing, attempts to keep workload evenly distributed. So we have push migration, periodic task checks load on each processor and if found pushes task from overloaded cpu to other cpu so push migration meaning if this processor uh, is overloaded what the os will do is that it will lessen the load of this overlay uh, overloaded processor and it will pass it to other processor which is idle or relatively has easier thing to do than the overloaded processor and then we also have this pool migration idle processors pull waiting task from bc processor so that is the uh, pull migration so we also have another for multiprocessor scheduling is the processor affinity when a thread has been running on one processor the cache contents of that processor stores the memory ac accesses by that thread we refer to this as a thread having affinity for a processor or the processor affinity. So load balancing may affect processor affinity as a thread may be moved from one processor to another to balance loads. Yet, that thread loses the contents of what it had in the cache of the processor it was moved off of. So that will be the problem for load balancing for processor affinity. So we have two types of affinity. First is we have the soft affinity. The operating system at the attempts to keep a thread running on the same processor but no guarantees. 
And then another one is we have the hard affinity allows a process to specify a set of processor it may run on. So we have the NUMA and CPU scheduling or the non-uniform memory access. So if the operating system is NUMA aware, it will assign memory closest to the CPU the thread is running on. So that's why uh, for non-uniform memory access, it will also have the so-called processor affinity or of course, it will assign the memory closest to the CPU that the thread is running on. Because it's difficult if, if, uh, if the memory that you're going to choose is the other memory from another computer system. So it will be difficult. Okay, next is we have real-time sch CPU scheduling. So can present obvious challenges. So we have two types of real-time systems. We have the soft real-time systems. Critical real-time tasks have the highest priority, but no guarantee as to when tasks will be scheduled. And then we have the hard real-time systems. So tasks must be serviced by its deadline. Okay, so that's the two real-time CPU scheduling. So we have this event latency, the amount of time that elapses from when an event occurs to when it is serviced. So we have this um, example. So event E first occurs and then for the event uh, for the event E, so real-time system responds to E. So since event E has already occurred and then the real-time system responds to E, that is the event latency. So the two types of latencies affect, affect performance. First is the interrupt latency, time from arrival of interrupt to start of routine that services interrupt. And another one is the dispatch latency, time for schedule to take current process of CPU and switch to another. So for the interrupt latency, so we have this example, um, task, uh, task T is running and then there is an interrupt in the system. So first is determine the interrupt type. And then since this is uh, the interrupt has a higher has higher priority, so task uh, T running will be preempted. So there is a context switch, and then we have the in, uh, interrupt service routine, and then the time that the interrupt determine determining the interrupt type and context switching, that is the interrupt latency before doing the interrupt service routine. Okay, next is again the dispatch latency. The conflict phase of dispatch latency is we have preemption of any process running in kernel mode. So that's the, con the, that the causes of the conflict phase of dispatch latency or release by low priority process of resources needed by high priority processes. So this is an example. We have an event and then this is the response. Uh, then uh, next is we have, since there's an event that occurred, there will be an interrupt processing. So process made available and then the dispatch latency. And then we have the real-time process execution. And then for the dispatch latency, it has also the conflict phase and also the dispatch, the actual dispatch. And then from the event and the first response to the event, that is the response interval. So next is we have priority-based scheduling. So for real-time scheduling, scheduler must support preemptive priority-based scheduling, but only guarantees soft real-time. For hard real-time, must also provide ability to meet deadlines. So processes have new characteristics. We have the periodic ones require CPU at constant intervals. So has processing time T, deadline D, and period P. So, 0 is less than or equal to T, is less than or equal to D, is less than or equal to P. So, rate of periodic task is 1 over P. So, we have the rate monotonic scheduling. So, a priority is assigned based on the inverse of its period. So, shorter periods, of course, shorter periods has higher priority. It's like um, the short, it's just like SJF. So, shorter periods is higher priority and longer periods is lower priority. So, P sub 1 assigned 
a higher priority than P sub 2. So, uh, because of the rate monotonic scheduling, there is a cases of missed deadlines. So, we have process P2 misses finishing its deadline at time 80. So, the solution for missed deadlines is we have this earliest deadline first scheduling or the EDF. So, priorities are assigned according to deadlines. So, the earlier the deadline, the higher the priority. And the later the deadline, the lower priority. Actually, you are doing this. We are doing this uh, type of uh, earliest deadline first scheduling. We're going to, um, you should have a prior knowledge of the deadline of a certain project. And if you knew if this is the first to be submitted, of course, uh, it has a, uh, the deadline is nearer compared to others. Of course, you have the priority to do that first. So that is the earliest deadline first scheduling. Okay, next is also we have the proportional share scheduling. So, T shares are allocated among all processes in the system. An application receives N shares when N is less than T. So, this ensures each application will receive N divided by T of the total processor time. So, next is we have the POSIX real-time scheduling. So, we have the POSIX 0.1B standard. API provides function for managing real-time threads, defines two scheduling classes for real-time threads such as the sched underscore FIFO and the sched underscore RR. So for sched underscore FIFO, threads are scheduled using an FCFS strategy. So FIFO means first in, first out. It's just the same with first come, first serve. So with a FIFO queue. There is no time slicing for threads of equal priority, unlike with the priority scheduling with round robin. Then next is we have scheduled underscore RR similar to sched underscore FIFO except time slicing occurs for threads of equal priority. So defines two functions for getting and setting scheduling policy. So we have two for get sched policy and set sched policy. So this is the code for the POSIX real-time scheduling API. So, the continuation of the code. Okay, so next is we have the operating system example. So, how does the CPU scheduling is done with Linux, Windows, and Solaris? So, for Linux scheduling through version 2.5, prior to kernel version 2.5, run variation of standard Unix scheduling algorithm. So, version 2.5 moved to constant order of O, scheduling uh, O of 1 or O, uh, 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 the running time, uh, the uh, scheduling time. So for Linux scheduling uh, uh, through, through version 2.5, so scheduling is preemptive priority based and then two priority ranges, the time sharing in real time. So real time range from 0 to 99 and nice value from 100 to 140. Map into global priority with numerically lower values indicating higher priority. So, higher priority gets larger time quantum or Q. And then, task runnable as long as time left in the slice, which is active. And if no time left, which is expired, not runnable until all other tasks use their slices. And then, all runnable tasks track in per CPU run queue data structure. So, we have two Priority arrays, active and expired, and then task indexed by priority, and then when no more active arrays are exchanged. So it worked well, but poor response times for interactive processes. So next is we have for uh, Linux scheduling in version 2.6.23 and above, we have the completely fair scheduler or CFS, and then... Um, it will be uh, discussed on a separate um, slide. So, scheduling classes, each has a specific priority. Scheduler picks highest priority task in highest scheduling class. And then rather than quantum based on fixed time allotments, based on proportion of CPU time. And then two scheduling classes included, others can be added. So, it can be default or real time. So, quantum calculated based on nice value from negative 20 to positive 19. So, lower value is higher priority. Again, 
And then calculate target latency, interval of time during which task should run at least once. And then target latency can increase if, say, number of active tasks increases. And then CFS scheduler maintains per task virtual runtime in, in variable vRuntime. So associated with decay factor based on priority of task, lower priority is higher decay rate. It's like aging. And then normal default priority yields virtual runtime is equal to actual runtime. To decide next task to run, scheduler picks task with lowest virtual runtime. So the CFS performance. So the Linux CFS, let me let allow me to read the text. So the Linux CFS scheduler provides an efficient algorithm for selecting which task to run next. Each runnable task is placed in a red-black tree, a balanced binary search tree. As I, I hope that you can still remember the BST, whose key is based on the value of V runtime. So this tree is shown below. Okay, it's a balanced binary search tree. So when task becomes runnable, it is added to the tree. If a task on the tree is not runnable, for example, if it is blocked while waiting for I.O., it is removed. Generally speaking, tasks that have been given less processing time or smaller values of vRun time are toward the left side of the tree and tasks that have been given more processing time are on the right side. According to the properties of a binary search tree, the leftmost node has the smallest key value, which is for the sake of the CFS scheduler means that it is the task with the highest priority. Again, their highest priority is smaller than number. Because the red-black tree is balanced, navigating it to discover the leftmost node will require the runtime of zero log n operations where n is the number of nodes in the tree. However, for efficiency reasons, the Linux scheduler caches this value on the variable rb underscore leftmost and thus determining which task to run next requires only retrieving the cached value. So let's continue with Linux scheduling. So real-time scheduling according to POSIX.1b. So real-time tasks have static priorities and then real-time plus normal map into global priority scheme. And then nice value of negative 20 maps to global priority 100. And nice value of positive 19 maps to priority 139. So this is the uh, illustration for the Linux scheduling. So Linux supports load balancing, but it's also NUMA aware. So scheduling domain is a set of CPU cores that can be balanced against one another. So domains are organized by what they share, such as cache memory. Goal is to keep threads from migrating between domains. Okay, so this is the physical processor domain. So for this type of uh, setup, so domains are organized by what they share. So this, uh, this is to keep threads from migrating between other domains. Okay, if we have Linux scheduling, we also have Windows scheduling. So, Windows uses priority-based preemptive scheduling. So, highest priority thread runs next. So, the dispatcher is the scheduler. Thread runs until number one blocks. Number two uses time slice for the round robin. And number three, preempted by higher priority thread. And then, real-time threads can preempt non-real-time. Of course, because real-time should be, that's why it's called real-time. It should be actual, that is, uh, it should be synchronized with the actual activity or event. So it can preempt none real time. And then we have for Windows, we have 32 level priority scheme. So variable class is 1 to 15, real time class is 16 to 31. Priority 0 is memory management thread. And then there is a queue for each priority if no runnable thread runs the idle thread. So that's why it does not necessarily mean, mean necessarily mean that if you left your computer without you doing it, it is nothing to do. But actually, they are running the idle thread. So the Windows priority classes. So Win32 API identifies several priority classes to which a process can below can belong. So for Windows, we have the 
real-time priority class, the high priority above normal priority, normal priority, below normal, and idle priority. All are variable except real-time. So a thread within a given priority class has a relative priority. So the, uh, these are the time critical, highest above normal, normal below normal, lowest and idle. And then priority class and relative priority combine to give numeric priority. And then priority is normal within the class. And if quantum expires, priority lowered but never below base. So if wait occurs, so for, for this one, priority boosted depending on what was waited for. Foreground window given three times priority boost. Of course, b why? Why does the pro, uh, foreground window is given the three, uh, thrice the priority boost? Because the user is interacting in that interface. And then Windows 7 added user mode scheduling or UMS. So what is this? Applications create and manage threads independent of kernel. For large number of threads, it's much more efficient. And then UMS schedulers come from programming language libraries like C++ concurrent runtime framework. So this is the table for Windows priorities, of course. The highest priority, of course, is the time critical and real time. While the uh, lowest is, of course, for the idle row and idle priority. So for high above normal, normal below normal. This is um, um, the least priority. Okay, next is we have, so we're finished with Windows. Next is we have Solaris. So Solaris is priority-based scheduling. So six classes are available. We have time sharing, which is the default, interactive, real-time, system, fair share, and fixed priority. Given thread can be in one class at a time. Each class has its own scheduling algorithm. Time sharing is multiple uh, multi-level feedback queue. So loadable table configurable by system admin. So this is the dispatch table of Solaris. So again, the uh, uh, zero is high, the highest has the highest priority, lower number. And then also for uh, for this uh, for this table, so interrupt threads is the highest priority, followed by the real time threads, the system threads, the fair share, fixed priority, timeshare, interactive. These are the lowest priority for Solaris scheduling. So scheduler converts class specific priorities into a per thread global priority. So threads with highest priority runs next, runs until number one blocks, two uses time slice, number three preempted by higher priority thread. So multiple threads at same priority is selected via the round robin. Okay, so we've already studied the different scheduling of Linux, Windows, and Solaris. So we have this algorithm evaluation. So, what are we going to do here is knowing the scheduling concepts of, for example, first come, first serve, shortest job first, the non-preemptive, the preemptive shortest job first, and round robin and priority scheduling. We have a given, so, so for this one, so how to select CPU scheduling algorithm for an OS. So, determine criteria, then evaluate algorithm. Then we have deterministic modeling, type of analytic evaluation, takes a particular predetermined workload and defines the performance of each algorithm for that workload. So again, those five uh, scheduling algorithms that I've mentioned for algorithm evaluation, for example, you are given five processes arriving at time zero. So this is the given for P sub one to P sub five and their corresponding burst time. So P sub 1 is 10 milliseconds, P sub 2 is 29 milliseconds, P sub 3 is 3 milliseconds, P sub 4 is 7 milliseconds, and P sub 5 is 12 milliseconds. So deterministic evaluation is what we're going to do is we're going to perform the Gantt chart of each of these scheduling algorithm. 
So, calculate minimum average waiting time. So, you're, you can only calculate the minimum average waiting time easier if you have a Gantt chart. I don't know if it's possible to calculate the minimum average waiting time without constructing the Gantt chart. But to make sure is you have to create the Gantt chart for each algorithm. And then simple and fast but requires exact numbers for input applies only to those inputs. As, as I've said, uh, with first come, first serve. Even though the given does not change, but the order, it matters. So for FCFS, for the example of that, is 28 milliseconds. Of course, P sub 1 is first, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Then for non-preemptive SJF is we have 13 milliseconds. So shortest job first. So the shortest is P sub 3, which is 3 milliseconds, and then followed by P sub 4, which is? 7 milliseconds, 3 plus 7 is equal to 10, and then followed by P sub 1, which is 10, so 10 plus 10 is equal to 20, and then P sub 5 is equal to 12, so 20 plus 12 is equal to 32, and last but not the least is we have P sub 2, which is 29, 32 plus 29 is we have 61. Okay, and then we also have a round robin of... 23 milliseconds so the time quantum here is 10 milliseconds so as you can see with p sub 1 so 10 milliseconds since it's it is it really fits the time quantum so p sub 1 is already finished uh, after 10 milliseconds and then followed by p sub 2 which is 29 so 29 minus 10 is we have 19 so 10 plus 10 is equal to 20 then P sub 3 is only 3, so that's why 20 plus 3 is equal to 23. Then P sub 4 also fits the 10 milliseconds time quantum, so we have 23 plus 7 is equal to 30. So then P sub 5 is 12, so again, time slice is, or time quantum is 10. So 10, 30 plus 10 is equal to 40. So for P sub 5, you ha it has only 2 remaining milliseconds. And then, let's go back with P sub 2. So, we have, uh, again, 10. So, 40 plus 10 is equal to 50. So, the only left uh, for P sub 2, 2 burst cycle is 9. And then, for P sub 5, we have, as I've said, we have 2. So, that's why 50 plus 2 is equal to 52. And then, for P sub 2, which is 9, 52 plus 9 is equal to 61. So, that is how... Um, you you illustrate there is a given processes burst time and arrival time and you have to uh, be well versed of the different scheduling algorithms that we have studied for today so next is we have queuing models so describe the arrival of processes and CPU and IO burst probab probabilistically so commonly exponential and described by mean then computes average throughput, utilization, waiting time, and others. And then computer system described as network of servers, each with queue of waiting processes. So knowing arrival rates and service rates, and computes utilization, average queue length, average wait time, and others. So we have this little formula. So N is the average queue length. W is the average waiting time in queue. And then we have this symbol, which is lambda, average arrival rate into Q. So, Lil's law, in steady state, process leaving Q must equal process arriving thus, N is equal to lambda times W. It is valid for any scheduling algorithm and arrival distribution. For example, if on average, 7 processes arrive per second, and normally 14 processes in Q, then average wait time per process is... 14 divided by 7 is equal to 2 seconds. Okay. So, again, the, the this is the formula. Uh, this is the solution based on the formula of Lil's formula or Lil's law. Okay, next. Uh, for the first example, we have deterministic evaluation. You're going to do it manually. But there are also the so-called simulation. So, queuing models are limited. So, simulations are more accurate. 
And then program model of computer system, clock is variable, gather statistics indicating algorithm performance, and then data to drive simulation gathered via random number generator according to probabilities, distributions defined mathematically or empirically, and trace tapes record sequences of real events in real systems. So, the evaluation of CPU schedulers by simulation, for example, is we have the actual process execution and the, this is the data for the trace tape. And then, um, they have a simulation for first come, first serve, SJF, and the round robin, which is quantum slice or quantum time of 14. So, since it is a simulation, it will output its uh, performance statistics for each of every scheduling algorithm. So, the implementation. So, even simulations have limited accuracy. Just implement new scheduler and test in real system. It is high cost, high risk, and environments vary. So, most flexible schedulers can be modified per site or per system. Or APIs to modify priorities. But again, environments vary. So, this is the end for Chapter 5. So, if you do have any questions, so... Feel free to, uh, to comment below and ask your questions. And I will have a separate lesson or video tutorial for the CPU scheduling algorithm, specifically for first come, first serve, the preemptive SJF, the non preemptive SJF, the priority scheduling, and round robin. So that's why, uh, and then we're going to um, do, we uh, should know each of the scheduling algorithm. And we're going to have the algorithm evaluation, which of them is optimal based on the sets of processes. So I hope that you've learned something today so that, uh, that every one of you has benefited with this lesson. So thank you very much. Good day. God bless and stay safe.